Very good. Well, welcome everyone to our Whiteboard Advisors Monthly Book Talk. My name is Allison Griffin. I am thrilled to be with all of you. This is a program that we started um, about two years ago when we all realized that getting together in person um, for whether it be book talks or social events or conferences was going to be very challenging. We decided to bring the authors um, that we read and respect uh, to our audience. And I would say while a lot has changed over the last two years and maybe over the last few months of sort of getting back to normal, one thing um, has remained the same, and that is our monthly book conversation. And so really excited today um, to bring to you all a lunch hour book talk. We usually do this book talk um, toward the end of the day, but have found that um, a lot of people, at least in the mountain and Pacific time zones, um, were interested in taking uh, their lunch hour to hear directly from an author. So we're mixing it up a little bit. And I'm really excited today um, to bring to you my colleague, um, my professional friend, someone that I have had the opportunity to get to know over the last year or so, um, Van Quinlevin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you are the author of a relatively new book. I will say I had the opportunity to, to talk with Van last year about her work um, particularly um, in the health space, uh, the health industry and workforce development area. Um, her book, Workforce Rx, Agile and Inclusive Strategies for Employers, Educators and Workers in Unsettled Times is one that I actually read um, in less than a week, Van. You um, wrote a page turner. It was timely. Um, you are thoughtful, but provocative and you have a lot of great strategies for us to consider as we think about the future, um, particularly in the workforce development space and the connection between education and employment. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the format of our book talk, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Van. I have a few questions for her. I hope those questions prompt you all to develop some questions or even reactions of your own. I hope that over the course of the conversation that you will put your questions um, in the chat. Feel free to do that. Um, and when we get to about half past the hour, I will turn to the audience uh, for discussion directly with Van and you can choose to ask her your question yourself or I'm always happy to act as the moderator. So with that, Van, welcome to our Whiteboard Advisors Monthly Book Talk. It's wonderful to have you join us today. It's great to see you again, Allison, and my thanks to you and Whiteboard Advisors for hosting this book talk. Absolutely. So I'm going to kick us off because I think before we get into the book, the best thing for our audience is to know a little bit about you. I would love for you to share with us what brought you into the workforce space what created that passion that you write about, that you bring to your book around economic opportunity? Tell us a little bit more about your own story. Well, Allison, um, my career has spanned the private sector, the public sector, and now the nonprofit sector. And so my vantage point um, is combining best practices from all three. So just a little bit of background. In the private sector, I took a company of 20,000 from having no opinion in workforce development to becoming a nationally recognized industry best practice. And then was appointed by the governor of the state of California to drive the workforce mission of the California Community Colleges, which as you know, is the, the largest uh, higher education system in the, the country. Um, and now I'm a CEO of Futuro Health, which was uh, founded by Kaiser Permanente and other partners, really to tackle the allied health workforce shortages uh, that's plaguing the country. But you know, to your question, it's like, where did I get started? Because all of these roles have had very um, uh, uh, sticky issues, right? And it takes a lot of grit and persistence. Like, you know, everyone who's on, on this uh, call, you know, uh, you have to have the staying power in order to uh, push the frontiers and figure out what the best practices are, and uh, oftentimes with a lot of resistance. And, and I think back to uh, my early days, um, my family escaped from uh, Vietnam 
the v Vietnam War. I was just uh, six years old at that time, turned seven when I uh, arrived here. And, you know, my parents had, um, had been a, a doctor, actually a neurosurgeon. Uh, my father was a neurosurgeon. My mother was a, a teacher, which was a very esteemed uh, occupation in Vietnam. And the war overnight just wiped all of that out. So they came to the United States, had to restart all over. My father had to restart his, uh, his, his medical um, uh, education. And interestingly enough, they were never bitter about having to restart. Um, and they were always appreciative. As a matter of fact, one of the messages my father said to me was, you know, Bon, we're, we're not going to give you a lot of stuff because in their experience, stuff can be taken away. Instead, they said, what we're gonna give you is your education because no one can take that away. And so I, I think I've always held that as a core value. How do I pay it forward, that education to others, knowing that higher education can unlock uh, economic opportunity if we, if we do it right. So that's what motivates me to wake up and uh, slay some dragons and uh, to discover some of these best practices and, and novel ways of combining them. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think personal stories are so important. It grounds our work and our perspective. And I think also um, makes, makes each of us more approachable in the work that we do. So thank you for sharing uh, your, own, your own story. So in your book, you highlight workforce development strategies for the public, private, education, and nonprofit sectors. And as, um, I'd love for you to talk about whether these strategies are the same across those sectors and what are some of the strategies that you wish those sectors would adopt more widely? So if you uh, just open up like chapter one of the book, it lays out the fundamentals of workforce development. And um, what's surprising to some is that, you know, workforce development is actually a team sport. It's not an individual sport. Um, and what's the team that has to come together? Uh, it is, a, I call it a three-legged stool where each of the leg represents a different set of stakeholder. And if we can combine and braid our efforts, we actually get much further than if we attempted to do it on our own. So, you know, leg one is the employer. What should they do best? I mean, they should articulate what they need and then uh, hire um, and invest. Uh, what's usually, um, oh, let me lay out the three. So the employers, they need to do what they do best. And then second is the education, which is to close the gap between the population and then what the employers need. And then the third leg is a community-based organization or workforce board who can do a much better job at reaching out to the community uh, and then bringing diversity into the pipeline uh, that matches the screening criteria. So when all three come together, uh, that works really well. What should, what should employers do differently? Well, most employers jump to the conclusion that they need to tackle their workforce needs alone. And, um, and that works to some extent, but what's really helpful to make this engine go is if they can work together in, um, as a consortia. Uh, so let me, let me explain why. Um, I call it in chapter one, the issue of the fire hose and the garden hose. So in education, we have a phenomenon called the fire hose. You bring together a cohort of students, maybe 25 or more, because the economics of education requires you to have at least some minimum number of students or you have to cancel the class. Anybody who's a faculty on here will understand that. And then all the students go through the education, they all come out with the same time. Now, what happens on the employer side is the garden hose where they drip out jobs, one job, two jobs, three jobs. They rarely drip out 25 of the same job, right? And so the, there's a mismatch between the two systems in a way. And the way to make it work is when you start pooling jobs amongst employers, they could be uh, members of your supply chain uh, who have similar jobs. Uh, they could be uh, competitors. They could be part of the uh, trade associations, right? So thinking more about a collaborative model where you can pool jobs in order to match systems can make it much more interesting for uh, the education system to be uh, responsive and to be able to sustain because uh, education systems hardly ever do a one-off program. 
uh, if they can't do it, be, be able to repeat it multiple years. I can see the fire hose and the garden hose. Um, I, I see that as you describe it. What a great visual uh, for all of us to think about um, those systems. And, oh, sorry. Go oh, and, and Alice, I forgot to, to mention on the public sector side, it's a different challenge, right? Um, so yes, it does start with some resources on the public sector. I mean, nothing moves unless it's resource, uh, but money is not the only thing uh, to, to really, uh, create the economic opportunity and line up the training path. There, those individuals who lead public uh, systems need to think about how to align the monies, the metrics, and the data. The mm. monies, the metrics, and the data. And that creates the virtuous circle for the right behaviors uh, to realize the intent of the public policies. And that's really uh, where folks fall down. They get the money, but then it's like the how it's measured it is inconsistent. And then there's no data feedback loop so that uh, you know, uh, grantees and players can actually uh, adjust and um, recalibrate themselves based on how they're performing. Absolutely. And I, I feel like sometimes the, the money, the metrics and the data, sometimes when you have the data that tell you, um, you know, about the impact or you know, where you have opportunities for learning or growth, um, my experience has been that sometimes we don't focus on as much about what hasn't worked and we want to instead elevate what does. But uh, I have seen over my career that sometimes hearing about the things that didn't work are actually more instructive than um, being a part of the things that have. Uh, has that been your experience or do you see it through a different, a, a different lens? No, absolutely. And uh, what's also difficult is, is how do you, the data itself isn't the end. The data itself is catalytic to the, the discussion, right? So we had, uh, when I was heading the California Community Colleges, we put a lot of investment to clean up the data and make the data useful, like data tools. Um, so the kind of conversation that we wanted educators to have was to look at their data. Well, they were looking at their dashboard. It's called a launch board, the, the tool that we created using their own data. And they looked at themselves and said, hey, great, we filled up the whole course. Good for us. Enrollment was great. And they said, hey, look, everybody completed. Completion was great. So they, they congratulated themselves. But then when they looked at the workforce outcomes, whether the students were landing in the workforce, they began to question, well, um, people are not getting employed. So what are we doing wrong? And um, like most people, then uh, a lot of uh, folks don't want to be told onto, and it's the, the data is what grounds us in the sort of the catalytic conversation to figure out what's not going well. And then um, equally important is how do you then find out who the best performers are or who are the exemplars? There are, six, there are 68 or so nursing programs across California community colleges. You can then look at the data and see who, who's performing well on these workforce outcomes, pick up the phone or email them and, and find out what practices they have in place in order to replicate. There's no need to, to uh, start from scratch. That's right. No need to reinvent the wheel, as they say. So I'd like to turn to your work at Futuro Health. And can you talk a little bit more about the model that you are using to address the skills and worker shortage in the healthcare space? And what in particular might you highlight that um, addresses that intersection between the workforce and the post-secondary education space from an education to employment uh, standpoint? Well, um, just for your audience to ground them, you know, a healthcare across the whole country, about roughly 60 to 65 percent of that workforce is a, a group of workers called allied health workers. So imagine like if you were in a car and, and I hope this doesn't happen, you know, you were in an accident. Everyone from the person driving the ambulance who comes to uh, uh, care for you to the medical assistant who checks you in to x-ray tech, you know, all basically all the techs that touch you in your hospital experience, minus the doctors, minus the high level nurses and minus the administrators, pretty much everybody else in your uh, uh, healthcare experience would be an allied health worker. So we will need a proportional share. We all will want a fair share of these allied health workers in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, 
So Kaiser Permanente is a, a very large uh, uh, health system in multiple states. And they have a history of actually creating new institutions like the School of uh, Medicine in order to deal with workforce shortages. Um, so when I, uh, you know, when I was approached by Kaiser uh, Permanente and its partners, they were wrestling with this allied health shortage. There was, uh, in California alone, it's uh, uh, 500,000 workers needed. Uh, so we had the option to be propping up another institution, right? But is that going to actually begin to solve at scale? And so we said, no, we're not going to actually become a, a, an education institution. Instead, we would build a workforce ecosystem because what we were trying to design is a solution, a workforce uh, solution to the workforce shortage that could begin not to address 25, 25, 25 students at a time, but would get to thousands and thousands of students at a time with attention to diversity, so scale and diversity. And then of course the pandemic has made us pivot. All of us are pivoting left and right. Uh, so skill sets are pivoting very fast in healthcare. And so we needed to, to design a workforce ecosystem with attention to scale, um, uh, diversity and um, uh, ability to be agile. Um, and in that way, you know, we've taken, for example, a bread and butter occupation like medical assistant. We started about with roughly 400 medical assistants, um, went to 1,200 medical assistants, now going to 2,200 medical assistants. But we do that through a whole network of colleges who we've curated and uh, streamlined so that it's an easy process for the students to be able to move, move through and get their education. So this is this is um, taking a set of best practices and combining that so that the, the you know the students can move through uh, education again so, solving at scale because of the magnitude of the issue. That's what uh, so this is the work of Futura Health. I love that. I love that. And so a question for you just in follow up: Are all of these students? located in California, or do you have students who are coming to you remotely? Oh, we have, um, well, we were born three months ahead of the pandemic. So by <laughs> just sort of by hook and crook, we had to operate in the virtual environment. Uh, so our funding has, our initial funding has been in to, to, to test uh, uh, all these processes in California, and we're looking forward to going multi-state with other additional partners. Um, yes, but you know, students can come from anywhere, uh, and then um, they're coupled with live student supports. Uh, I see er Elliot Billingsley here. Uh, thanks for being a Futura Health uh, navigator at, in partnership with us. Um, uh, we have a partnership with Inside Track, which we're just so pleased. Uh, and so that allows us to support students across a range of programs, whether it's pharmacy tech, lobotomy, medical assistance. Every year we roll out, you know, four to five new programs into our catalog to begin shipping away at this workforce need. It's so real to me. I, um, of course, know your work through our past conversations and, and your book, but every time we talk, I learn something new. And I'm even thinking about some of the challenges that um, I've been a part of in rural Colorado. Um, I serve as the board chair for a public university um, in Colorado, and we're trying to meet the needs of our rural workforce, particularly in the allied health space. And so the model you have just laid out the, the work you have done, particularly in California, you're right, it is incredibly transferable um, to other states, to regions, to communities where we really need more of a collaborative approach um, as opposed to a, a sharp elbows approach, if you will. Um, and so thank you for your leadership um, and visioning and what you- Well, Allison, we're, we're beginning to have um, other types of uh, new practices come about uh, we, you know, because the higher education has seen such a drop in, in enrollment uh, over the pandemic, you know, with community colleges, when I was with the community college in the last downturn, people were flooding to the community colleges and there wasn't enough money to have seats for them. This time we have the opposite problem where there's almost 20% drop in a, enrollment with the community colleges, which tends to be the cheapest, most affordable system. Mm -hmm. And the colleges have money to spend they just can't find the students. 
So we've been fortunate that what we're doing has really attracted adults to come back into higher education. So our average age is 30 with 80% diversity, 52%, 51% uh, bilingual. And so now we're actually developing relationships where we're, we're, we're doing the work to bring the adults back into the education system in novel ways. So if your rural uh, hospital employer has the clinical, the direct patient care um, mm -hmm. part of it, you can begin to decouple the education and the education can come from a different place yes. that is responsive. So it's, it's um, we're doing that with uh, some community colleges right now. That's great. Well, you know that we'll, we will continue to follow up on that after this conversation. And I'm sure there are others who would like to do the same. One thing that you touched on as you were describing your model and um, helping us all to get grounded in the work of Allied Health, can you talk a little bit more about what is driving the talent shortage in the allied health space? And my understanding is that ha was happening far before the pandemic. Tell us a little bit more about that. And then what are our workers facing in terms of barriers when it comes to upskilling? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. The shortages were already evident before the pandemic. And then I know everybody recognizes how it was made more severe. Um, just to give you an idea of the economics uh, affected by the, um, you know, effectuated by the pandemic, you have uh, temporary nurses, for example, um, who used to be very temporary, like come in for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Well, now they are staying months, like three months, six months, a year and, and more. And that's causing dissatisfaction with the staff nurse that is standing right next to them, who is saying, well, why should that person be paid three times what I'm being paid? And so it's causing the staff person to quit, join the temporary agency, get placed back into exactly where they were before. So now you still have a shortage because you haven't created any new nurses. Uh, but the uh, the organization is paying three times for the same person. So this is what is happening in healthcare. It made it into a New York Times, uh, you know, front page uh, article. So um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of motivation right now to figure out how to break that cycle. Right? You can poach from each other, but it only causes the uh, the 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 price to, to rise more? How do we begin to grow the, the, the talent pool? And I think this is where, again, um, we need to think about how to work uh, in collaboration so that we can braid efforts um, and then build the pipeline by moving people, especially communities, um, to the rungs and think about it, not only just the first job, but also think about how, they, how you set the breadcrumbs so that folks can go into the first job but then can stack their credential to the next job, to the next job, right? Because some of these jobs are in the six figures, but it's very hard to make the distance if you go from zero you know, to 100, but you could do it through a set of stackable credential if it's already organized. Yes. Especially nursing. Nursing is, is a whole set of uh, prescribed uh, uh, credentials. Absolutely. And I, so I've seen that stackable model play out across institutions, right, where there's some articulation and transfer agreements and relationships. I've also seen that happen within a single institution where a learner might start with a certificate and then they're able to leverage that certificate and the work experience into an associate's degree, you know, step back, work experience, associate's degree into that bachelor's. And so not only is the institution, the provider, the employer, you're creating that affinity um, between you know those partnerships, but you're also creating this um, community of learners and employers and professionals um, in that in whatever that um, industry might be that is more than sort of in and out, but it's about building those relationships and that longevity um, for that that learner that employer. Yes, um, you know, in my book, I talk a lot about the stackable credential and the importance of instructional redesign. Mm -hmm. um, so I, let me let me give something tangible. For right now, one of the after effects of the pandemic is really the mental health, behavioral health pandemic, right? So uh, when I talk about behavioral health, it's like alcoholism, drug use, uh, uh, depression. I know everybody understands what's happening um, as a result. 
The shortages is in the master's level. Those are the, the, the they call it MSW, uh, LCSF, all these acronyms. I mean, you're trained as a therapist and you're the only ones that can do it. And that's the master's level. Well, my gosh, the distance between where most of us are to the master's level is really far, especially for diverse community. So how do you, you know, where can you begin, right? Uh, we, we've had like Kaiser Permanente put out scholarships, but then only very few are, can make it um, into that, that echelon. So when we talked about 19 employers, they said, hey, start with a community health worker, but don't do a generic community health worker. So community health worker is someone who comes from the community and is very culturally competent and is trusted. Give them a behavioral health micro-credential. So community health worker with behavioral health micro-credential. So now you get getting somebody in in less than a, than a year, like a part-time. Um, first credential. Now, how do you then stack it so that you can get into an AA in uh, drug substance abuse? How do you get them into the, the social worker, which is a, 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 a like a bachelor role uh, to do some, some key functions? And then would be better if you could combine a bachelor and a master's in a four plus one instead of six years in order to accelerate somebody getting into the, the therapist. This is a long road. I mean, when we're playing catch up, uh, so in some of the workforce, um, it's a long road, right? So again, it's easier to, if, if you can transact for the talent, which apparently the healthcare industry is not able to do at this moment in time, uh, then we have to figure out how to break the cycle with workforce development strategies. That's right. Absolutely. And so then um, on the workforce development and employer side, how do you fund the upskilling or reskilling or just um, bringing adults, perhaps with some college and no degree, back into the workforce. Um, are there organizations that are doing this well? What have we learned um, over the course of the last few years? Uh, fortunately, over the last decade, thanks to uh, leadership of many, and, and my call out would be like Jamie Fall and the Aspen Institute, done a lot of work to rally the, um, the employer community to offer uh, tuition benefits uh, to frontline workers. So not, not just your high potentials, but also to uh, frontline workers. So Walmart rolled it out with a program that was basically a dollar a day. They, you know, it's important for people to have skin in the game. So they put in a dollar a day. And then the training itself wasn't necessarily tied to the company, but uh, tended to be the, the programs that were in demand somewhere else. So Amazon followed suit, Starbucks. So this now a great number of companies that that have that benefit uh, for individuals. Um, and I think that's great. And uh, one of the things on the toolkit as a best practice is that for this front line, cash flow is such a big deal. So tuition reimbursement is actually a deterrent because that means that you actually have to have the cash up front to pay for it before it gets reimbursed. And 40% of households in America have less than $400 in their savings account. Mm -hmm. So if your company has a tuition program, uh, the best practice is it, make it a tuition support rather than a reimbursement after the fact. And that's available if you Google, um, you know, Aspen and tuition uh, support um, mm -hmm. toolkit. Great. I think um, reimagining how we use financial resources um, and tapping resources that perhaps we hadn't thought about in a way to bring um, particularly our adult learners um, back into education and training programs is so important. Those new uh, sort of innovative finance models and structures um, couldn't be more important uh, now than, than ever. So I want to, oh, I have a couple additional questions, Vaughn, for you, but I want to open up our conversation to our participants, to our audience. Um, for those of you who have joined us today, if you'd like to ask a question of Vaughn, if you would like to turn your screen back on, um, come off mute, and I'd be more than happy to, to call on you so you can ask your question. Do we have questions, the audience? Carlos. Please ask your question. Can you yes, uh, uh, share your name and the organization you're with uh, before you turn to your question? Uh, sure. My name is Carlos Carpizo. I uh, represent uh, Cosmos. It's a venture that I have uh, developing Generation Z talent through socially responsible gaming. And my question, not surprisingly, it's geared uh, towards this segment of the population, which is 
uh, quickly growing and will represent 30% of the workforce by 2025 and it'll just continue to grow from there. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, Van, on these different generations that we're seeing in the workforce? I mean, we hadn't had that many generations in the workforce in the past. Well, um, you know, my uh, talking about gaming, you know, my 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 teenager, uh, interesting enough, has all these multiplayer games. And when they go into the games, they are able to collaborate very immediately in the, in the execution of the play. And I think employers need to figure out how to transition those individuals that grew up in that environment into our work environment. And especially the pandemic has really messed up all the culture norms of the workplace. So I, I do hope that as you're thinking about socially responsible gaming, maybe there's, a, there's probably some product value in helping to norm individuals who are coming into the workforce who like learn, picked up some habits during the pandemic that may not be as productive for them um, in, in the work environment. So good luck on, the, on that venture. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Elliot, I see you have your hand up. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Allison. Uh, thanks for welcoming me. Carlos, that sounds like a cool idea. I'll uh, like to keep in touch with that. Um, well, if it's all right, Allison, I wonder if I could share a student story from a uh, perspective of, uh, I work directly with the students uh, and learners in Futura Health, or the Futura Health Scholars. Would it be all right if I shared a quick story? Absolutely. I would, I, I know I would love to hear a student story. I'm sure our audience would too, please. Awesome. And, and may I, I, may I then, I'm sorry, camera. may I then um, segue, do you then have a question uh, for Vaughn from that student story? Actually, I do. Great. I might. Yeah, I, I do at the end. Um, and is my camera, I think my camera is lagging. So I apologize if that causes dissonance. <laughs> um, so um, I, w I was working with a student named, uh, actually uh, named Andrea. And uh, so she was in, getting enrolled in a medical assisting program. I worked mainly with MAs. Uh, MA candidates, and uh, she she lived in Oakland, and there was a rolling blackout going on, and she had the understanding that because of the rolling blackout, her internet was disconnected. I'm just going to turn off my camera, and she was wasn't able to attend an exam online, and thought she failed the class. Well, it so happened that after like a conversation with me, we kind of worked through and factored out the problem and determined that it was entirely something else. Like she forgot to enter the text in a certain part of the screen. <laughs> and it was something so simple and it was explained by that. And so I think there's an idea about when people feel as though like the world is against them and like the system is stacked against them, there are ways to get out of it. Uh, and it takes a thought partner and that's what we provide it inside track to, to like, and encourage them to kind of think more broadly around around it and help them strategize the future. Um, so I'm really proud to be part of that, that team and supporting the Futura Health Vision. Um, yeah, the question I had, um, if, you, if you don't mind, Vaughn, uh, I've heard a little bit about, <clears throat> I, I listened to your podcast and read your book, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, I'm curious about how um, this like, new financial model that you discussed in one of your podcasts I can't remember the name of the really, really smart guest you had, uh, where there's a different ways to to fund and finance. I think one of the um, other pathways, not MA, um, where in the after they complete it, there's a, an arrangement with an employer, something along those lines. And of course, I'm butchering it, but I, I'd be curious to hear what the developments are in that area. So you probably. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Elliot, uh, for the work you do. I, I want to just make a comment from this, your student story. I think everybody on this phone realizes as the more diverse the communities we work with to bring them back into higher education, the more the student support component is. And in the last two years, uh, in all the inbound calls from our students, you know, it, it has been brutal. <laughs> the, the, the situations and the, the traumas that they've had to deal with uh, from fires to homelessness to death to illness. I mean, it is has been a lot on adult students. And so without an infrastructure to do their, um, you know, to, to do the live supports, it's very difficult to, for students to be as resilient as we need them to be in order to persist in education. 
Um, so Elliot, I think you're actually referencing uh, social finance, the CEO of social finance is a leader in this area of rethinking uh, student fi financing. And they have a, a number of states uh, where they're exploring uh, pay it forward funds. So this is whether the, the private sector, the philanthropic sector and the public sector could break funds, right? To, in, in order to establish really um, a, pay, a loan repayment program, very benevolent terms, uh, not, not high interest rate or anything like that. Um, and then if uh, once a student uh, exits the, the training, lands in their job and is able to hit a certain threshold, a minimum threshold of salary, then they begin the, uh, a fixed repayment. So it's also called outcomes-based loans. Um, there's also other derivatives, but I think this is one where uh, we need to rethink all the different mo modalities because even just for healthcare alone, when we were doing the focus groups, and, and uh, figuring out what students needed when, we're when we were creating Futuro Health. When they got into that first rung, they were so saddled with debt that they couldn't climb the second rung. So how do we begin, as I call it, the breadcrumbs? The breadcrumbs, the financial component ought to be like um, employers, if you want them to retain, how do you forgive those loans? Like forgive 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, which is what you would be paying the, the staffing agencies anyway, right? So how do you use that as a, re a retention? Um, uh, 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 the, the equivalent would be, um, you know, like ROTC where you do the service, right? So I think now is the time to think, rethink all the different tools that we have at our disposal. Love that. Thank you, Elliot, for both the student story and the question. Um, you know, I, I think, Vaughn, if, as you've been talking this, this afternoon during our time together, you know, we have been talking about post-secondary education. We've been talking about workforce. We've been talking about the ultimate economic impact on communities. And it's almost as if we took all of those sort of silos and put them under this, you know, sort of talent, you know, headline. Um, and if we started thinking about the, you know, interconnected pieces between post-secondary education and training and workforce development and community economic growth needs, I wonder if we would create systems and structures and programs that looked a lot different than what we have now. If we started almost with the learner at the center instead of the system. Um, what's, your, what's your thought or reaction to that idea? Right, so uh, first part where the systems break down is for example, the transition between high school and college and the economic opportunity. So you know, 80% of students stay within their kind of their commuting region, right? Um, so uh, what I saw when I was executive vice chancellor was that we would have high school with, with uh, academies, like theme career academies, but then the academies didn't match the economies that were within that region. So students then didn't have any affordable uh, post-secondary education, higher education program to step into. So that was one area that we had to, we had to fix, uh, which was let's make sure we motivate the colleges, the community colleges, for example, in, in that region to have programming specific to the, uh, the uh, industry sectors that drive their economy. So we actually um, had every region look at the data, uh, economic data, talk to all their partners and say, what are the top five industries that, that drive your economy? Mm -hmm. So you'll have uh, economies that are driven by IT or biotech or global trade uh, or healthcare. So, so you know, different economies drive different, uh, um, different industry sectors drive different economies. And then getting the higher education systems to recognize that, hey, then we need to put in workforce program, career education program, so that students can get the, the skills in order to successfully transition into the workforce. And then at the lower level, then what we need to do is increase awareness, career awareness. So, and that needs to happen as early as middle school, because if in middle school, you don't hit your math sequence, right? Then some of the careers will be um, you know, off your grid. So really, we have to do the work. At, you talk about systems. As middle schools, career awareness, you begin to um, map pathways uh, that keep options open. 
um, at the high school, make sure that there are workforce programs at the community college level. Um, and then in all cases, employers need to be at the table uh, in order to uh, drive these things uh, because they're the ones that can inform the skills that are needed. Absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for your thoughts on that. Janet, I see you have your hand up and you have a question. Yeah, I'm wondering, Vaughn, I hadn't realized until now I'm looking at your Twitter feed that you're on the board of the National Student Clearinghouse and I can imagine no better representative with your experience. I'm wondering, are there things that you're really excited that you see coming around the corner that people might not be aware of as far as like, how are we gonna connect education and those labor force outcomes? Like we're, we're ready and willing and really interested to hear about those things. Well, um, you know, Thank you, Janet. You know, I, in, in chapter nine, I, I talked about um, a, a dean, a career education dean stood up at one of these conferences and he said, Vaughn, you must free the data. And I thought, what are you talking about? What, like, are we taking data at the state level and just sitting on it? And, and apparently that was true. So data often tends to come from colleges, come from the ground, move into the state agencies, but there's nothing that comes back to them in terms of useful tools. And so the, really the work is to uh, convert that data into something that is useful for continuous improvement, right? Uh, and I'll just fast forward at the end of the day when we rolled out the tool, basically every single program, every single certificate, every single degree, at every single one of the 116 community colleges, you could tell how did students fare uh, two years before on wages, two years after, five years after. I mean, that is how powerful that data became um, because not all of these occupations are created equal. Some have more mobility than others. Um, so once you create that type of powerful tool, then, the, then there's, there's more self-monitoring and then you can put more incentives against the programs that deliver both on uh, good completion, but also good workforce outcomes. Um, for for this for the student, and what's so powerful these days, uh, Allison, is that we have so many more options on education than before, right? All of a sudden, th thanks to the pandemic, everybody had to move everything online, uh, whether it's virtual or hybrid, but do it with simulations and all you know all sorts of other ways when we didn't have that option before. So if you don't have a quality education program in your backyard, now you can look more broadly. So Futuro Health, in order to get the solutions, the education path set up, we, we figure out what occupations are in demand. And we have education partners that come from Washington State, uh, Iowa, uh, Delaware, California. So we bring them all together in order to craft the journey uh, for the student. Mm -hmm. And students are used to that now, getting used to that now because they had to live in the virtual space um, um, during the pandemic. And of course, you have to couple this live student support no matter what you do. Right. Absolutely. Jana, I'm so grateful for your question um, and Vaughn for just making that connection between the education and employment uh, data work. You know, this idea of just exposure to people and roles and industries that may not have been um, as readily available, let's say, in that face-to-face uh, -face environment. I think that is, I mean, spot on. I, I mentioned at the very top of this talk, and some of you on the call know this, but I have two middle schoolers, and their exposure over the last two years to both education and employment opportunities, because they were engaged virtually, has grown a hundredfold. You know, they've been, you know, piped into their classrooms, people from across the world who they would not have necessarily had exposure to um, if it had not been for, you know, this, these two years of, of virtual and or distance connection. And so I look at that as a silver lining. And then I think about how that applies to our adult learners, to our broader workforce, just to have that connection and, you know, seed some new ideas and pathways. Um, through a through a virtual forum that didn't exist previously. So I love that. Absolutely. Other questions or comments, reactions 
Um, for Vaughn, I definitely have a, a follow-up question before we uh, wrap up this afternoon, but I'd love to give you all that one-on-one -on -one time. So I'm gonna ask my, my question. I wanna leave us on an optimistic note. Um, so as we look forward, hopefully soon, truly post pandemic and moving into a time when we are going to see more intentional connection between education and employment, largely um, built upon the foundation that you've created and the work that you've been doing um, for, for many, many years in California. What are some ways that workers, that employers, um, I'm sorry, that employers, that companies can better support their employees, their working learners. Oh, what there's so many. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so many ways. I, I think the one key thing that employers need to do, and, and I think all of us who are partners with employers could do, is put um, is look around the corner, especially where how skills are evolving. Um, you know, in the book, I, I reference uh, Singapore as a city state. What do they do in order to look around the corner? Um, and what they do is they actually use innovation leaders to be the harbingers of how skill sets are likely to change. So there's an airport, Terminal 5 in um, Changi uh, Airport, where it's they fully automated this airport. Like, there's no baggage checker. There's nobody looking at your tickets. I mean, there's nobody even uh, being deployed to do the, the, the janitorial services. That's all being deployed by robots, et cetera. So when you look at uh, uh, how that has been automated and how it functions, then you can infer like, what's the change in the workflow and the change in workflow actually informs the changes in skill set. So, how does uh, the janitorial uh, uh, functions happen? Well, it's a, it's, there's a group of people watching the data, the data panels from afar, and they're, they're deploying the robots to go uh, do the cleaning functions, right? So then where, where are the skill sets? Well, it's gonna be people reading the, the data panel. So the, that type of uh, developing those uh, tools, but also being able to monitor those tools will be important. Is it any different in healthcare? No, I mean, what you're beginning to see is care, care moving to the home with uh, doctors centralized and allied health workers moving into the home. So then um, who's watching all the monitors that are at the hospital? Who's watching all the monitors that are in the home in order to figure out the alarms, right? So you, you can begin to see how skill, skill sets change the technology literacy, the data literacy, all of that goes up. I mean, it's changing the nature of jobs. Even doctors who want to go into that field, the recommendation is you should be comfortable with, with technology and technology tools. So I think one thing that employers need to do and all of us who work with employers need to keep an eye on where, you know, where's the puck going with regards to skills, look at innovation leaders to inform, uh, see how they're changing workflows. And then we, we can begin to seed programs. Because as you know, Allison, Human capital, it doesn't happen overnight. That's right. So we have to be able to look ahead or else we're already behind, right? And we have to intersect the future. And so that's, I, I think that's one area we could do much better uh, work on. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vaughn. It's been a pleasure to talk with you directly. Uh, thank you to our audience for engaging with you, for joining us today. And I hope that this book talk has served as a little bit of a Cliff Notes version, let's say, of the book. And I would encourage all of you um, to pick it up for your summer reading. I found myself to be quite inspired. And Vaughn, I have just found your ideas to be practical and approachable um, and appreciate you. For, for putting this work out into the world at this time. Well, thank you, Allison. I wrote like 10 chapters in a format of here's the challenge, you know, what's the challenge and here's the solution, challenge, solution. So I'm glad to hear that it's readable. Uh, so Workforce Rx, you can find it on Amazon or anywhere you uh, um, find your books. But also I have a podcast by the same name, Workforce Rx, it's free, uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And we feature leaders who are, who are thinking about um, you know the you know what's ahead uh, in terms of the future of work, the future of of, of learning, uh, future of healthcare. Uh, I think Elliot mentioned that he he listens to it, and so um, hopefully we can see you on the podcast or in the book. Or just so delighted 
uh, that you've created this book talk here, Allison. Absolutely. Thank you for joining our community and just being so open and approachable uh, to interact with our audience today. Really appreciate you, Vaughn. Everyone, Likewise. we will see you soon. Thank you, everybody, for spending your lunch with us. Yes, absolutely. Be well. Take care.